What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here at GSD Studios. First off, thank you so much for checking out today's content. I'll make this extremely fast, but I need to plug our sponsors that make this show possible. Our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com, by far the most effective and affordable real estate agent website and database platform in the industry. It is the system I use to sell 50 plus homes every single month. Check it out at www.perfectstormnow.com. Our second sponsor is my personal real estate agent mentorship program, www.90daymastery.com. All right, you guys, let's dive on into today's content. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode interview where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top, uh, top badasses that they're dominating their spaces. The people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, um, but instead to go out there and uh, create big, epic, amazing lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others while they exist. So today, guys, we have a really special guest on the show. Um, our guest today is a husband, father, um, a mega, mega entrepreneur, investor, uh, creator of Thrive, um, this dude's got a lot going on, so I'm really stoked and honored to have Cole Hatter on the show, the show, my friend. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, this is an honor, man. I'm, I'm excited, dude. So, um, you know, I, I know you got so much going on, right? Uh, um, I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of big things. Um, I think anybody that uh, is an entrepreneur that's on Facebook, um, you know, sees, sees your stuff out there, you know, right? Well, you know, all the crazy- Retargeting. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, but I'm always really intrigued, you know, because obviously you didn't start here, right? So I'm always really intrigued in our guest journey that led them to entrepreneurship in the first place. So if you run the clocks, maybe, and whether that looks like junior high, high school, what, whatever it was, like what led you into the, the entrepreneurship journey in the first place? So very, very, very first was, I don't know, eight, nine years old. It was Christmas time. And like most eight or nine year olds, mom and dad, buy presents for the sisters and mom and dad and say it's from you, right? And I was adamant one year that I wanted to do it. And I'll never forget it. I was at the mall and I saw in a shop that they were selling mistletoe. And I realized this stuff grows for free in the trees near my house. I could pull it out of the trees and sell it too. Like that was the first time my little brain said, wait a minute, something is selling for money that I can go get for free. So I climbed a tree, pulled down a bunch of mistletoe, put a little red bow on it and went door to door and sold like one for $3, two for five and ended up making like 200 bucks. And for my little eight or nine year old mind, my mind was blown and I remember it vividly. And so that was like the first time my brain ever connected with, wait a minute, if I want something, I can control getting it. And if something requires money, I can do something to generate money. Like I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. I didn't probably didn't even know how to say the word, but in my little mind, something went off, right? Fast forward, you know, I started a clothing company in high school and stuff just for fun. So I guess I was always the entrepreneur. But what made me finally have to become a real entrepreneur of like, you know, paying taxes and employing people like a real entrepreneur is uh, after a car accident, I was a firefighter. Uh, So I graduated high school, did not pursue entrepreneurism, pursued being a firefighter and uh, was doing that for two years, was 21 years old and I got a really bad car accident. I was in a wheelchair for a while. um, And so My long-term recovery was uncertain uh, from that car accident. And obviously, you have to be in perfect physical health to be a firefighter. So it looked like for a time that was out, and I needed to be able to be self-sufficient regardless of my physical capabilities, which, by the way, I'm totally – I'm sitting down now, but I can walk. I'm good. And so uh, that's where I turned towards entrepreneurship, actually, in real estate was my first business that I still own 12 years later. Uh, I went and got my real estate license, became a realtor, and I realized that I wanted to be an investor, not a realtor. So I started investing in real estate in 2005 and that's really it. So I have dabbled in entrepreneurism since I guess eight, but became an actual entity, you know, filed my articles of of incorporation with the secretary of state of California, June 1st, uh, literally, oh my gosh, that's so crazy. Whenever someone's seen this, it is June 1st today. So that is rad. It is literally my, what is today? Uh, It's the 12 year anniversary today that I became a legal entity entrepreneur. Uh, And the rest is, as they say, history. Yeah, love it, man. Happy anniversary, dude. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's so funny because I, I tell that story all the time, June 1st, 2005, and it is, as of recording this, literally June 1st. So that's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so I'm, I'm curious, man, of, you know, you, you had that, 
you know, at eight years old, you know, because we're, we're conditioned by our parents of money doesn't go on, grow on trees. And at eight years old, like you literally proved money grew on trees, right? So, <laughs> oh, that's classic. You know, I right? never so, actually put so, that together. Um, um, and then you, you start your clothing company. Um, like, wh- like what happened that, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of changed from going to, from an entrepreneur into a firefighter? Um, you know, like, like what was that transition period? Or, or, I mean, was it something that was conscious or not conscious that just kind of happened? Yeah, so firefighter, I got a crack in September of 2004. Uh, I got my real estate license in March of 2005. And from September until March was mostly just physical rehab, you know, learning all the walking and all that stuff again. Uh, and Dan and I actually had to move back to my mom and dad's house. Like the, my injuries were pretty bad from the crack in. I mean, I'm skipping over that, but it was, it was a bad accident. So I had to move back in with mom and dad and be cared for for the first while. Then as I was recuperating, um, what actually turned me on to real estate was my parents next door neighbors. She was a realtor. He was a broker and they were killing it. They had a beautiful house, really nice cars. And I had always heard that there's money in real estate. So, uh, be, uh, one day in a conversation with my next door neighbor's wife, she told me she'd made over a hundred grand the year before that, uh, you know, here in orange County, California, where I live, the medium house, uh, medium price point of real estate is, um, uh, 680,000. And getting paid a two and a half to three percent commission, you only got to do five or six of those a year to clear six figures. So, I saw the opportunity within real estate. I became a realtor, started taking my classes, took my prerequisites, took my state, and then passed my state exam and became a licensed real estate agent. March two thousand five, accidentally ended up in a real estate investment seminar. I didn't know there was a difference between being a realtor and an investor. I thought everyone in real estate did the same thing, so it was a real estate training. So I said, cool, I'm just going to go learn real estate and uh, saw the difference between getting commissions and profits. So decided before I'd even hung my license or really even acted like a realtor, decided, hey, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start flipping houses, et cetera. And so, so that was really the transition. Um, there was nothing romantic about it. I just saw my next door neighbors were making money. I'd heard that real estate was great. I wanted to do something I knew I could do on my own without ever needing a boss you know, or, or having to rely on anybody else. And ended up loving it, and here I am, twelve years later, still doing it. Yeah, epic, dude, love it, dude. So, all right, so so you're you're a real estate agent. You, you stumble into this class, you know, right? Um, kind of unintentionally, and, and and you kind of find this new this new drive, this new passion. Um, what a lot of people don't talk about is like that first deal, you know, right? Like you see so many mega real estate investors or flippers or whatever, and, and they kind of start like a few deals in, you know, and, and, and it's so tough. I think, cause I think dude, every realtor secretly wants to go out there and be an investor. Right. And sure. everybody kind of deep down is like, man, I don't want to be taking these buyers out, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, there's, what, a, there's a joke fun. about that. It's what does every realtor and every investor have in common? They all want to be investors. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so how does that first deal happen? Because I mean, I, and, and I don't know if you flipped it in Orange County, but I mean, you're, you're talking high price points. Um, you know, you got to raise some capital to, to make it happen. I mean, how, how did you, how did you come across that first deal? What did you do? And, and um, kind of walk us through how that whole journey started there. So the very, very, very investment deal isn't very exciting. It was just a buy and hold. Um, the financing, which no longer exists back in 2005, stated income, stated asset, 100% financing. Yeah. So I got into a rental property in Phoenix, Arizona. I bought a two bedroom, two bath condo, put a renter in there, uh, qualified at 21 for the mortgage. And uh, again, state income, state asset, 100% financing. I actually got money back at closing um, because I forget how it all worked, but uh, there, was a, there was a builder's credit. And so I bought it for 100% financing. And then the builder gave me my credit back. So I ended up closing and making 18,000 bucks. Now I owned a condo that was cash flow me, I don't know, a few hundred bucks a month. So that was the first deal, not very exciting. But the first flip of actual moving parts, um, I pitched my dad on being my business partner. He agreed. I also pitched him on giving me all his money. He disagreed. <laughs> and he taught me one of the most valuable lessons in entrepreneurship is that there's no such thing as handouts. You know, I'm not going to start your career off son by giving you money. That's unrealistic expectations. That's not how the world works. So I had to go out there and raise money for my first deal. And this is probably the most co- common stumbling block I hear from people who want to invest is, well, I don't have the money. Well, cool. Neither did I. And I had just gotten out of a really bad car accident and had medical bill debt and all that stuff. And so what I did was I found some with the money. Uh, there was a man who went to our church who was a real estate attorney who drove a big old sexy Mercedes Benz and just looked like he had money. And so I took him out to lunch, built a relationship with him, talked about what I wanted to do. He obviously understood the real estate market. He's a real estate uh, attorney. And after a few lunches, convinced him to 100% finance the deals. 
that my dad and I would do and that we would split the profits 50 50, which is really expensive money. If I could have borrowed it for a lot cheaper from a private lender or hard money lender, but uh, by doing a deal with him, at least I was getting 50% of something and that's better than a hundred percent of nothing. And so he went off to fund our first several deals. And I want to emphasize this wasn't some rich uncle. This wasn't a friend of the family. This was someone who I just happened to go to church with who was a complete stranger who I took out to lunch and build a relationship with. So there are literally no excuses. That was uncomfortable. I was 21. He was 50 something. I had barely any experience in real estate. He was a real estate attorney. I had all these little stories playing in my head of why he would never say yes, but I still mustered up the courage to take him out to lunch. And he said, yes, after a few lunches, he said, yes. So we did that for a while. And then we started splitting the deals three way instead of it being 50, 50, I would get a third, my dad would get a third, he would get a third. And we went on to do like 20 deals together. And that's where my business began. Uh, so the specifics of the first deal was nothing great. Just bought a house, fixed it and sold it. Uh, I think what's uh, as far as a teaching standpoint is where I got 100% of the money to purchase it and renovate it. I put zero, not one cent of my own money into it was because I partnered with a guy who had the money. He did zero work. I did all the work. I put in zero money. He put it on the money. We split it. And then, like I said, we eventually put it in the thirds. Fast forward, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I have blenders and things like that where I'm paying much better, che- you know, cheaper money. But that was, that was deal one. And um, it was just a single family residence. Uh, I don't even remember the specifics. Probably like a three bedroom, two and a half bath, 14 to 1800 square foot house. Nothing exciting. We just bought, fixed and sold. And uh, the rest is, as I say, history. Yeah. Not, and I love that you brought it up, dude, that, that this wasn't a guy that you knew, you know, per se, it wasn't like a good friend of the family. I mean, you, you went out there and you, you networked, man, you developed right. relationships and which anybody can do 7.4 billion people on the planet. There's no shortage of people with money, you know, right. I mean, you, you find that deal. So now was this all taking place in Phoenix, Arizona? Uh, no. So that the first rental property was in Phoenix, Arizona. I live in Orange County, California. So this is now happening Uh, in Orange County, California, as well as Columbus, Ohio, which is kind of random. Uh, We ended up in a bad deal in Columbus, Ohio, where I lost money. Uh, And then my dad and I realized it was a commercial project. Um, We can talk about that if you want. But uh, we lost a bunch of money on that. A guy ended up going to jail because of it. Uh, Bad experience. It is what it is. And my dad and I said, well, this sucks. We lost money out here. Let's build a team and start flipping houses out here and make our money back. So, uh, but originally my business did start here in SoCal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's another objection. So a lot of people like you, like you pointed out, say, Oh, I don't know anybody with money. Well, neither did I networked. Right. Uh, then other people who live in markets like orange County, where a condo is 400 grand and a house starts at like 600 grand. They say, Oh, I don't have enough money. It's just zeros. It's, it's no more difficult to renovate an $800,000 house in orange County than it is an $80,000 house in Memphis, Tennessee. It's the exact same process. Why I like expensive markets is, it's not only more expensive to buy and fix it, but when you sell it, it's more expensive, which makes your profits larger. You just add zeros. So don't be afraid of the big deals. I would say too, for anybody who's, I know we're focusing on real estate right now, but anyone out there who's in the real estate game who might live in a market that's not the cheapest. Awesome. That means you're going to make more money per deal. It's no more work to flip up, you know, I mean more square footage, sure, potentially, but it's no more work to flip an average, you know, 2000, 2,500 square foot house, in one market versus the other, you're just going to make more money potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And it gets to a point where like, cause I'm actually, I'm actually in Phoenix and you know, I mean, if you don't get to a high enough price point, you know, and cause it's, and we represent, I still have a real estate residence, real estate team out here in Phoenix and we represent a lot of investors. And I mean, some of these spreads just get so thin. Right. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, can be a challenge. So, um, uh, so I actually, I mean, I got in the, the real estate industry, same year you did 2005, um, um, became a realtor here in Arizona. I'm, I'm still a realtor. Um, but, uh, uh, but dude, I mean, we all know what happened after that. Right. And I mean, yeah, I've had okay. guys yeah. on this podcast. I mean, I had, a, I had a guy not too long ago that got stuck at the, at the, when the market dropped out with 200 properties and, and just, he's like one day, one day I'm rolling in a Ferrari, living large, thinking I'm God. And the next day, like I, I'm leaving God. the state to get away from creditors. Right. And, right. and, um, you know, so, so what was that like, man? How was that transition, um, uh, uh with that? 2007 to 2008. Yeah. I mean, just, just cause I mean, this, this is going great, right? You guys are, yeah, you guys are yeah. doing good. And I mean, did, did you get caught? Did you, Totally. So good news, bad news for both of us. We started our business in 2005 where my strategy was buy a house, count to 10 and sell it for a profit. I mean, you couldn't lose. Everything was insane. Like I mentioned earlier, financing was 100% financing, state income, state of assets. So everyone could afford a mortgage. Everyone could afford a house. 
Uh, interest rates were lower than, I mean, they're not as low as they are now, but they were lower than historically. So cheap money. So my dad and I were freaking rolling in the dough. 2007 turned into 2008. And I don't know about your business. I didn't start trickling down. I went off a freaking cliff. It was like, oh, same story. I wasn't in a Ferrari, but oh, living in the high life, done, over, done. And so it was brutal for me. I was completely over leveraged. I'd bought houses at state income, state asset, 100% financing that were no longer worth what they were worth before. Uh, I've had to ride those out, right? Um, I ended up foreclosing on one. Uh, so I have one foreclosure, which is pretty remarkable considering how many of them were over leveraged. Uh, and that's good at my credit for a while, but it is what it is, you know. Um, I luckily didn't have to go as bad as bankruptcy, which many of my colleagues did, and I'm sure some of yours did as well. So I've never had a BK. I have had a foreclosure, and I had to fire sale everything I owned. Uh, at 21 through 24, I'd owned three different Cadillac Escalades. I had a $100,000 wakeboard boat that I'd take out there to Lake Havasu. Not necessarily in your neck of the woods, but still, Arizona. Um, and I mean, oh, I would call my buddies and say, meet me at the airport and bring clothes for three days. They wouldn't even tell them where we're going. And I'd bought them all tickets to Vegas because I was making certain months, not every month, certain months, six figures. You know, we'd have a couple of things pop and they would all end up in the same 30 days. And I'd have six figures worth of checks sent to me. And then there's other months where I'd have no money at all, no, no closings. But when I would be 23 years old and make a six figure month, I would be an idiot and go and spend it all. So all of that came to a crashing end and that commercial deal was, was the nail in the coffin for me. I uh, was approached by a guy who, like you said, hey, margins are shrinking. Uh, residential's a risky business now. You guys should start investing in commercial. Uh, everyone's going to lose their house in this foreclosure wave. They're all going to go and buy uh, rent co uh, apartments. So start buying apartment buildings. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, so we ended up giving this guy our last 170000 bucks between my dad and I, like the last of it. We went all in and said, screw it. We're committed. Let's do this. Gave the guy everything, 170000 And as I said, he went to federal prison. We lost all of our money. So now not only was our business not working, we had blown everything we had. And we had to slowly reinvent ourselves. And for about two years, dude, it was brutal to the point that I actually quit my real estate business. In January, or no, excuse me, in February of 2010, I resigned. I told my dad I'm out. I don't want to do this anymore. I quit. And um, I moved to Mexico and I joined a nonprofit where I worked five days a week building houses for homeless families. I started an orphanage and I just did philanthropy. I was like, I'm over business. I'm going to go be a philanthropist and just do humanitarian work the rest of my life. That lasted about 10 months. And then in the spring of 2011, invested in some education, got a mentor, stopped winging it and actually learned systems and business and went on to make millions of dollars since then. So uh, that was kind of the season from 2008. It was like hemorrhaging and bleeding. 2009 was like scrapping by trying to make it 2010. I took the year off 2011. I got started again and have been going up ever since. Yeah. Yeah, I love it, man. It's like um, you know Warren Buffett's quote: when, "When the tide goes out, you know you, you see who's skinny dipping." And, and yeah, who's you know, skinny dipping. but but the cool thing, dude, is um, <clears throat> as hard as those moments are, right? Like like you said, I mean, you were just you were out there spending every penny that you made, and and as painful as those moments are, they they end up just defining us, right? They become our greatest oh. assets. The, the, those so anybody that's because there's a lot of a lot of people, not just real estate. I mean, all, a lot of entrepreneurs that that are going through. Um, a really tough time. I mean, like what kept you pushing forward in that time? And what, what advice would you give if, if somebody's kind of in that same situation right now? Well, when it comes to dealing with it, I mean, there's a lot of analogies that are flying through my head right now, but you just gotta, you've just got to have a bigger reason. So for me, part of what got me back is I got engaged. So this is my personal story. You don't necessarily have to get engaged, but uh, I wasn't necessarily feeling sorry for myself, but I lost my entrepreneurial edge. There's a little fire we all have or a big fire we all have under our butts that make us go through entrepreneurs, right? Like uh, we do things that other people aren't willing to do to get to live a life that other people don't get to live. There's, there's no such thing as something for free. People who have eight pack abs and like huge muscles, they live their lives differently. They don't eat dessert and they work out six days a week, right? So, so nothing happens by accident. There are no handouts in life. And what I love about being an athlete and an entrepreneur is it's totally fair, there are people obviously that are born with better genetics or whatever, but I mean, like you get out what you put in, in the gym, you get out what you put into entrepreneurism. So that's the first thought. Number two was for me, um, I lost that edge and I was down in Mexico doing philanthropy and uh, my event thrive, make money matter. That's where it was born. I started an orphanage down there and I saw how just a few hundred dollars could feed an orphanage, of 21 kids. 
And I realized I was on such limited resources because I had no longer any income and was living off what little bit of savings I had left, which goes very far in Mexico. So I was like, dude, I can live for like five years just surfing and eating tacos. This is bad. Um, but then I fell in love with these kids and I realized, geez, like, um, you know, it's, it's a stretch for me to be able to continue to feed them. If I just started making money again, I could feed them and do other cool things. And so that's where the phrase make money matter came from. I found this connection of making money and then making it matter by feeding orphans. And so I decided, Hey, I need to go back to America. It wasn't that I was feeling sorry for myself down in Mexico, but I was just like, I'm over business. Um, and gotten this weird funk of, I'm not going to make any money anymore. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to literally give back. Uh, but then I came obsessed with this idea of, Hey, I'm going to go make millions of dollars so I can change the world. So that was motivator. Number one, number two was I ended up getting engaged in March of 2011 to my girlfriend, uh, you know, then fiance. And then we got married in September of 2011. So I, I quit my business. There's a lot of dates, but quit my business January, sorry, February, 2010, lived in Mexico, got engaged March, 2011. Uh, and now I realized number one, I have these kids down there that need me and I want to make an even bigger impact than just feeding the kids in my orphanage. Number two, I have a wife or a future, a woman that's about to be my wife that I'm going to need to support and someday children. And that re put that bigger inside of me to just do what I had to do. Uh, I, I bought a coaching program on credit cards cause I didn't have any money. I didn't want to go into credit card debt, but I leveraged it cause I said, screw it. Like I'm going all in and I sacrificed, man. I worked for a while, seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. This isn't romantic. This is reality, right? Like I'd love to tell you that I read a book that changed everything. No, dude, I just did what I had to do. I sacrificed. I, I missed going out to cocktail hour on Friday night and, and I was a ghost for like six or seven months reinventing myself. And then all of a sudden in the fall of 2011, and freaking crashing it again. So for me personally, I found two things that were bigger than myself. Number one, more orphanage. Number two, a potential wife or a, whatever, a, a fiance, soon to be wife. And that's what made me dig deep and say, all right, buddy, like it's time to suck it up. And you know, it's been fun surfing and eating tacos, but you were called to do more than just surf and eat tacos. It's time to go live your legacy. Uh, and so I would, how does that translate into your listeners? You got to find something bigger than yourself, man. This is, you know, you can read the book, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Um, but, uh, that's, that's a great point, uh, a great book of helping you find what that why is, but, uh, and, and this might even sound like some meaningless platitude. And if it does, I apologize, but that is exactly what I did. I didn't get any smarter. I didn't, uh, you know, figure out a new way. I just did what I had to do because I had finally found the motivation to make me get off my ass, stop just surfing every day and get back to work. Uh, yeah. Love it, dude. So, um, you, you, you know, cause a lot of people that, that may realize, okay, man, I, I gotta, I gotta get back to the States. I gotta, I gotta get grind. I've got, I've got this new why now um, that's bigger than me. Uh, but they, they may not jump right back into real estate investing like you did. Right. Um, and I know that you said you, you got, you went and got a coach, you went and got a mentor so you can do it the right way this time. Um, but do you think that like some of that time in Mexico, some of that time that, cause I'm imagining dude, you had some great time to do some deep reflection. They really right. kind of see, Hey man, here, here's where we went wrong. And, and, you know, cause so much of like a lot of people know what to do. They just, a lot of people just don't know what not to do, you know? Right. Sure. Um, so, I mean, did you, did, was that, you know, drive still there for real estate or, or did you just jump back in? Cause it's like the only thing you knew at that point. Yeah. So a couple of things I would say, as far as my time to reflect, Mexico was perfect. I would, I should never have stayed a day shorter. I needed that time. And for me, it was more than just business. Um, you know, I was dealing with some personal things while I was down there as well, getting, getting through some of my own demons, if you will. So the time I spent there, uh, as a resident, like I moved there, I wasn't visiting. Like I said goodbye to everybody, turned off myself and moved to Mexico. I, it was exactly what I needed. So the first thing that you were kind of talking about of time to self reflect and just be quiet and think, I think that I think more people need to make that a priority. I, you know, I don't meditate. Uh, I'm considering it because a lot of people, it seems to be like this emerging trend that really high performers meditate every day. I've tried it and I couldn't go longer than 30 seconds without being like, okay, I'm done. I need to go make a phone call. But uh, I think that quiet time and self-reflection is important. How that looks for you, whether it's journaling, meditation, prayer, whatever, I think that that's important. Uh, and personally, that's something that I was just talking to my wife about probably last week that I've gotten away from and I need more of. I'm, I'm, as you mentioned in the beginning, I'm running a bunch of different businesses. And, um, many of them are very taxing. And, and I've noticed myself maybe a little more irritable with my wife, my, my little girls than I normally would be. And so it's like, you know what? I'm not taking me time to be alone, to just be in my thoughts and reflect on what I like, what I'm grateful for and what I would do better. So I would say that that was on steroids in Mexico because that's all I did. I was just giving the people and self-reflecting. I would be 
building a house for a homeless family, feeding my orphan, or surfing, or jogging, or just alone. It was the, it was the longest period of life I've ever been in solitude, if that makes sense. I was with people, but I wasn't with my friends. I wasn't with my family. I was with the coworkers or alone. And so that was really helpful. So uh, I'm going to, you know, that wasn't necessarily your question, but you touched on it. I want to say that a lot of people need time to just self-reflect. Um, as far as me being excited about real estate, to be totally transparent, I was not because I just got my ass kicked in it. Like I freaking real estate to me was like the bubonic plague. Uh, so coming home from Mexico, I was like, it's what I know. Uh, and it's only going to take a few emails or phone calls to get it started again. So I'm going to do that real quick. And I'm going to turn into a side hustle and go do what it is I love doing, which I wasn't even sure what that would be. It's turned out it's thrive and other things. Uh, but then because I took a new approach to being a business owner, uh, and actually got some, again, coaching and, and ran my real estate business differently. I ended up liking it. And, it. and I found out it wasn't that I didn't like real estate. I didn't like how I ran a real estate business. Uh, and from 2000, probably seven, eight, nine, and 10, uh, those years of starting to lose money, losing everything, and then hanging on by the skin of my teeth, um, I didn't like that. And it wasn't necessarily real estate, the industry that was the problem. It was me. And I had to grow as an entrepreneur. And so now getting back into real estate again, but doing it differently this time, I actually enjoyed it. And so that's why here I am, 2007, still running my real estate business. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, did, 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 your, did your, uh, your dad jump back in with you or was he? Uh... He was still doing it kind of the whole time. Uh, when I left, we are complete polar opposites. I move fast. I'm, I'm loud. I make, I make things happen. I, I GSD. My dad is the fine, minute like making sure everyone's paid and like all that, uh, it, which is perfect. My dad's behind the scenes, making sure that everything's happening the way it's supposed to. And I'm creating the mess. So when I left for those 10 months, you know, the business shrunk, uh, which is fine. And it's not that he wasn't capable of running at the same size. He wasn't interested. Uh, and so he was still hanging on. I just reinserted myself um, and then made some new relationships. And like I said, started, started that machine up again. But I mean, when I got back, like, I think my dad was working on one house and that was it. It was, it was basically turned into his kind of part-time hobby. Uh, and so I said, Hey, I'm back. Let's do this. And, and we've blown up since to, I mean, we we're doing a deal a week at one point. And so, uh, we, we've toned it down now. We're focusing in the million dollar range. And my goal is to do 10 to 12 a year now, instead of having to do 50 and make 50 grand or whatever, I'm going to do 10 to 12 and make net, you know, one to 300,000 on each deal, uh, is our goal, right? That that's what the goal is. And so far so good. What today is halfway through the year. And so we're on track. Uh, so we've changed our business model uh, because I can't run a full-time real estate business while I'm doing everything else that I'm passionate about and running my other companies and, you know, being a father to these two beautiful little girls right here and everything else that's a priority for me. So we'll do maybe 10 deals this year with a goal of buying them from eight to 900,000 putting one to 200,000 into them. So we're in them between one and 1.2 million usually, but then sell between, depending on what we're into them for, 1.2 to 1.5. You pay your realtors, your closing costs, your carrying costs, interest on the money you're borrowing and all that, net 100 to 300 uh, is the goal. And uh, so my business has evolved, I guess, to be more of a part-time yet still seven for your business. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, dude. So <clears throat> I, I know today, I mean, you, you've got, you got multiple different companies that, that you're running. Um, you know, I mean, how, how do you connect the dots, man? Cause I mean, I, I see so many entrepreneurs that, that jump into a lot of spaces and it seems like, you know, they grow too fast and, and growth pains can crush them trying to take on too much. You know, how, how have you connected the dots where um, you've been able to grow multiple companies simultaneously? So I think the easiest answer for that that's, you know, something your listeners can apply is I got okay with not doing everything. I'm a control freak by nature. I want to control everything. And I had to be able to start a team and then trust the team. I literally can't do everything. And so there's a lot of parts within my companies that I don't know anything about. Uh, I didn't even know it existed. I'm finding out about it for the first time. Like, hey, that's really cool. Where did this come from? So that's part of the growth. You can't be you know, there's a great book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, and he talks about three types of business owners. There's technicians, managers, and entrepreneurs. Technicians do everything. They are the business. Like my gym trainer, I worked out this morning, and he's an amazing guy. I love him to death, but he has to personally show up to run his business. He is the trainer. So that's an example of a technician. These aren't lazy or dumb people. They just, they are their business, right? A masseuse would be another example of someone who is their own business. Entrepreneurs are someone who's created systems and outsourced and has a company that's 
system dependent and not dependent on them. They could leave for a year, come, like Warren Buffett. There's not a company Warren Buffett owns that if he took a year off, wouldn't be right where he left it or even better. Um, now that's the extreme, right? Warren Buffett has like 70 companies, but you get the point. And so for me to do several businesses that have nothing to do with each other, because if they were all within real estate, like I'm real estate, you know, I'm an investor and then I have a brokerage and then I'm like, that would be easy, but they have nothing to do with each other. They're in completely opposite ends of the business spectrum, many of them. And so the way that I'm able to do that is I start them. And this is good for me too, because I get bored. I bet you there's people listening to this like me that start a business, love it. And three months or three years later, like this is boring. Like the challenge is over. It's up. It's running. I don't, I don't, I don't get excited to come here. It's my baby. I named it. My, my face is on the wall, but I'm just not excited to be here anymore. I have that problem, shiny object syndrome. And instead of just killing the business or losing my enthusiasm and letting it slowly dwindle, I as quickly as I can replace myself and then go to do something new that I've always wanted to do. And uh, just for context, I don't want to sound like some superpreneur. I've probably started 20 businesses and like 16 of them have failed. Or I've probably started like 30 businesses and like 26 of them have failed and I have four that are working. So uh, it's not like I just go and start something and start making millions of dollars. I usually go start something, lose money, start something, lose money. But in the end, I'm up. I've made way more than I've lost. And in the businesses I've started that haven't worked, I've learned. So I don't call them failures. Those are learning experiences. Uh, but fast forward today, I'm again, as far as on paper, with all the losses, I'm up. And um, so I don't have fear of failure because I know that if, if it doesn't work, I'll just start something that does. Uh, but I guess that's the answer is, is for people who want to grow their existing business or start others, you can't do everything yourself. You can't be a gym trainer and a masseuse in the same hour. You can only do one or the other unless you hire trainers, hire mas how would you pluralize that? Masseuses, right? people who <laughs> massage. And then you actually start a business and then you call it 24 hour and massage envy and you don't have to show up anymore. Yeah. So, so just so everybody knows, what, what are, what are um, um, the, co the other companies that you have and, and what are the industries that they're in? So the big one that most people know me for, I mean, you know, people know I do real estate. They don't even know what it's called, but I have my event Thrive. Uh, and although it's a three-day live event, it is a full-blown business. It has employees. It has sales. It has marketing. So Thrive is, is the business I spend most time on. From Monday through Friday, I am doing something for Thrive hours every day. There's not a day I don't do a Thrive thing. So, uh, and what Thrive is, is a three-day business conference. Uh, we're going to have our third year this year. We bring in freaking rad entrepreneur speakers like Gary Vaynerchuk, Robert Hershbeck, uh, Grant Cardone, speaking of real estate, my mentor, Than Merrill. It's not real estate specific. It's just business related. And uh, we teach people for three days how to freaking dominate in business and then how to make their money matter by creating what we call for purpose business. Uh, so that's one that I own right there. Um, I also own a marketing company that I don't do really anything for. I just started it. Uh, I paid for all of it, the, like every dollar of it. I hired really rad sales guys and I hired really rad fulfillment people to do the marketing and was the glue that held them all together. And so all types of marketing from you say, if anyone's an entrepreneur, you see me on Facebook, uh, that's digital marketing, right? And so really good at retargeting you and if you've ever visited my website, you're going to see me in your Facebook page, etc. cetera. Uh, so we do that for other companies as well. Um, another one that's kind of fun is emoji stickers. Uh, if you go to emojistickers.com, that's something my buddy Sean and I started over a, a Chimay beer in his backyard. Um, I don't remember the year, but for those of us that are on iPhone, there was an update where emojis just became standard. You used to have to buy them in a third party app. But there was once a face or a iOS update on your iPhone that now emojis were just in everybody's keyboards. And he and I are sitting out there while our kids were inside watching Wreck-It Ralph. And we said, hey, man, we think there's an opportunity here. So bottom line is we ended up printing these emoji stickers. And uh, we, we have them manufactured in China, shipped to America. And as of today, we're in every single Urban Outfitters. If, if you're hearing this, I challenge you, go to your local Urban Outfitters, ask them for their emoji stickers. You're going to see them hanging on a shelf somewhere. So we're in every single Urban Outfitters. We're in some Nordstrom's, some Targets, and things like that. And what was just a fun idea has turned into an actual full-blown business where we're getting massive purchase orders of like tens of thousands of stickers for Urban Outfitters and all these other companies. We sell them on the website too. You can go to emojistickers.com and buy them. Uh, how many is that? What is that everything? Oh, um, I have some digital products. I'm a partner with Ty Lopez. Um, and we have a real estate educational course that we've started a business around there as well. Uh, so that's what I forgot about. Uh, that basically he runs, it's his thing, but we're 50, 50 partners in. 
And then, uh, what else? Oh, and then I have a pro merchant processing company I invest in as well that I'm involved in the operations. I have a bunch of businesses I invest in that I quote unquote own equity in that I have nothing to do with. I just, I'm hoping it works out. But the merchant processing company, I actually do uh, have some say in and I actually do some of the operation stuff. So that's what keeps me busy. Totally different industries. Yeah. So, so you're in the backyard drinking a beer, talking, you know, seeing the emojis, man. What was it? Uh, what was that conversation like, man? Was it, was it just kind of like a challenge to see if you could, you know, yeah, like, well, get... I got to give the credit to Sean. It was more his idea. He's like, dude, there's a business in this. And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. And so, um, you know, he spearheaded it. He had already done business in China. So he had some connections there and it was more just us having fun. Uh, and then, I mean, there's a lesson here. When we first launched, the emoji stickers were about the size of a silver dollar for sale for 50 cents, direct to consumer. We were trying our hardest to get people to come to our websites and buy our stickers, and it wasn't a profitable business model. So we then shrunk them down to like five millimeters or whatever. It's like a little bit smaller than a dime now. And we would put the entire emoji, uh, like every sticker they make, in packets. So you buy an actual packet, and there's like 50 emojis on each pack. And there's like 15 different sheets, if that makes sense. Um, and we started selling those for $12.99 instead. And then that's where Nordstrom's picked us up and everything else. So the lesson that I like to use of emoji stickers is our first idea failed. But instead of calling the business a failure, we just adapted and said, well, people don't want to pay 50 cents for a smiley face and then 50 cents for a heart and then 50 cents for a, a fist pump. They want all of them. So let's shrink them down, sell them for 12 bucks. And there you go. And so then we, that's, that's retail. And then that's what Nordstrom's and, and Urban Outfitters sells them for. We then sell them to Nordstrom's and Urban Outfitters for five ninety nine. dollars So uh, that's the wholesale price. So, I mean, it's great margins and uh, it's working right now. And it's a fad. I don't think I'll be doing this forever. Uh, but it was, it was almost like a joke that ended up being a multiple six-figure business. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the cool thing is there's always going to be the next fad that you can, you know, apply that to, right? So Yeah, and so for, for the listeners, because I always like to, to get the lesson out of that, like you might be saying, cool, I'm not in the sticker business and who cares about emojis? I don't use them. Uh, it didn't work. Our business didn't work. We actually had invested more than we made. And we were considering, as Mr. Wonderful would say, taking it behind the bar and shoot, or the barn and shooting it. Uh, but then we listened to what people were asking for. We listened to our consumer feedback. Uh, we started a, uh, an Instagram account. And people would leave comments like, can't I get more than just one? And so we're like, okay, well, the people that want to spend money for us are asking for something. Let's just do what they're asking for. So I think that that's really great in the world that we live in, that you can actually have conversations with your consumers, hear what it is they want, and then sell it to them. I don't know that that's ever been possible before social media, the internet, and email to have as immediate and broad conversations with your consumers and your customers than you can today. I think it's pretty phenomenal. And I would encourage any entrepreneur to do that. If your business is plateaued or if it's not making the money you thought it would, or if it's failing, if you have any business or any client or customer base or following, ask them, what do you want from me? And then freaking don't argue, don't have an ego, do what they're asking for because if that's what they're asking for, that's what they're willing to pay for. And so I, the greatest lesson I've ever learned in that was with the emoji stickers, right? Um, we could talk about that with real estate too. I might think a certain color or design patterning is great, but on my open houses, I get feedback from buyers that aren't making offers. They hate the colors. They hate the patterning in the, in the bathroom makes them dizzy. There's too many textures and tiles. So it's like, you can never have ego in business, whether it's designing a home with, with, Oh man, they're going to love like this tile in the shower and this accent tile and then this backsplash and then this flooring. And they get in there and they're like, Holy crap. I feel like zoo listen to feedback from people who are buying or not buying your products of why they didn't ask them what they want and then just give it to them. That's the easiest way to make money. What are you willing to pay me for Joshua? Perfect. That's what I'm going to start doing. Here you go. Yeah. Love it, dude. Love it, man. Powerful advice, dude. So, um, all right. So, I mean, you had, um, like you talked about earlier, I mean, you had, you had, you, you, you exponentially had more that didn't work out than yeah. that have been the winners. Um, I mean, what are some of the things that you've learned as you're entering a new space now? Cause I mean, business there is always risk, but you know, you can you get to the point where you can start to take very strategic calculated risks, right? Like, sure. um, you know, whether it's with your partnerships, the due diligence that you do before you decide to jump in this space, like what are, what are some of the things that you've learned that you'd give advice to, uh, for that, for our listeners? Uh, so this is a fine line and this is a hard one to teach, but Know when you need to adapt, like I did with the Moji stickers, and just know when you need to move on. 
Um, and the best way to do that is to look at responses, if that makes sense. So everybody thinks their idea is going to be the best idea in the world. They wouldn't start a business if they didn't. I don't know anyone that's like, hey, this is the stupidest idea I've ever thought of, but I'm going to sink all my money and time into it. Everyone thinks their idea is great. If it's not working the way you thought it would, listen, and then make the decision on whether you just need to adapt and change your existing product that the product has legs but needs some work or the service needs legs but needs some work or whether you just don't have a good business model and then don't be emotionally connected to the outcome. That's something I've had to learn over the years, but failing in business doesn't make me a failure. Uh, and so you cannot be emotionally connected to the outcome of any business, period. I see too many people that are too emotionally connected and it like whether they made money or not or succeeded or not is like defining them as a human being. Uh, and so I, that's easier said than done. But with growth, uh, realize that entrepreneurism is a long game. And if something you've worked on in six months didn't work, you still have 50 years of life left. Go do the next thing. Like, we're going to be here a while. Even if you're 60 years old hearing this and you're starting your business for the first time, you've still got a lot of time. And if the thing between now and September doesn't work, cool. Start something new in October, right? So um, that would be a piece of advice that I had to learn is when it just isn't working, but has enough legs that I just need to adapt or change it and then it'll work versus, hey, I thought this was a good idea. It's not. I'm over it. Let's move on. Like an example of a complete failure was a clothing company. I tried to start a clothing company and I didn't want to put the money behind it. I thought the name and the design was cool. It started selling. It was okay. But I realized I didn't want to be in the retail space, number one. And the effort it was going to take to try to get market share was going to be so expensive and so exhausting. I was just over it. I could have listened to my consumer of what designs they would have preferred or what type of clothing articles and, and just literally climbed that mountain. I just didn't want to. I thought it would work easier than it did. I had unrealistic expectations. So I said, let's cut our losses. We sold off our inventory and we were done with it. It was a, took it behind the barn and shot it. Didn't try printing a shirt again. We have shirts for my event thrive, but we're not a clothing company. This is just for people that want to wear, you know, the event. Um, so, so that'd be an example of me saying, okay, I know why it's not working. I have an idea of what I would need to do to make it work. And I'm not willing to spend the time and the money. So I'm unemotional. I'm not a failure. My wife's not going to kick me out of the house. My daughters won't say that daddy's a loser. I'm just on to the next one. Uh, I think that's an important lesson to learn as well. So, uh, you know, I can give you more lessons, but there, those are probably the two big ones right there. Yeah, love it, dude. So um, with Thrive, right? So you, got, you guys put on these amazing three-day events. You bring in, you know, epic, amazing speakers. Um, um, but I'm really interested about the, the, you know, make money matter, making money yeah. matter, right? I mean, what... What's that overall message and what are you teaching entrepreneurs there? So Make Money Matter goes back to what I was saying uh, that I personally experienced down in Mexico. Uh, there's making money and then making it matter. So let me give you an example. As I shared earlier, I had great income 2005 to 2008. Slowly lost money 2008, 2009, quit 2010, had no income living off savings. And while I was down in Mexico, feeding these little kids and seeing how such few of my dollars could go so far taking us dollars into mexico into the grocery stores in these poor parts of mexico a few bucks could buy them food for a week and so i looked back over 2005 to 2008 and the money i spent on vacations and the money i spent on putting five tvs in my escalade because four wasn't enough right i had to have i had to have one in every headrest and then the drop down 10 inch you know what i'm talking about because that's cool that nobody ever even used anyway because I always drove alone. I didn't have a family or kids yet. Um, and so I looked back on all the stupid things I did with my money and I said, that sucks. I enjoyed it and I don't feel guilty. But now that I had to sell it all, I have nothing to show for the success that I had enjoyed. There's no cars left. I've had a fire sale off most of my real estate. Uh, and it's like none of my success even happened. I'm now broke living in Mexico and there's nothing that I left behind. When I go back to America and make money this time, I'm going to make it matter is what I was telling myself down there. I'm gonna build businesses that while I make money, make a difference. Like Tom's Shoes is probably the most popular example for people who aren't familiar with that company. Blake Murkowski founded it on the premise that every pair of shoes he sells, he's gonna give a pair of shoes away. And they've adapted that model now because they got bigger than they ever thought they would and they're inundating these, these countries with free shoes. It's kind of throwing off their local economy. But uh, they're changing their model. But he created the four-purpose model that's probably the most popular of when they would sell a pair of shoes, they make money and someone would get a free pair that needed it in a third world country. So the more successful Tom's became, the more free shoes and people that were benefiting. 
And I said, that's how I'm going to run my businesses because heaven forbid I ever lose it all again, which I hope not. But if I did, instead of saying, oh, I had great cars, I don't now, I'd say, hey, I, you know, I, I had success. And there are people that have been impacted that will last forever. There's homeless families down in Mexico that I bought the house that they now live in. Um, and it's not as glorious as homes like you and I would live in. You know, these are, these are 16 by 20 foot uh, uh, homes that, that we build for these poor families in Mexico. But I funded those. I've built 37 of those now. And so, so I started doing things that if I ever lost my money again, there would be things that have actually mattered with the money I had when I had it that for the rest of my life will have created an impact in someone else's life. And I became obsessed with it, came home, as you know, got engaged, got married. My wife and I built all our business around this for a purpose aspect. And it got really interesting. I mean, people were asking me to talk about it on podcasts. I was getting interviewed for Inc. and Forbes and Entrepreneur and Huffington Post to talk about this for purpose business model. And there was clearly an audience of people that resonate with that, that were thirsty for not just making money, but making a difference simultaneously. Because most people think, hey, I'm going to get so rich that they don't have enough money to give back, like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. Most people don't think you can actually give back while you get rich. And then now that you're rich, you, you have the things you want guilt-free because you're also changing lives at the same time. And so when there was clear that there was an audience of people who really wanted that, we started Thrive and said, hey, let's create a three-day event where people can show up and learn this. And that's it, man. That's the evolution of where the whole story came from. I lived it. I, I personally know what it feels like to, they say money can't buy happiness. And I say, yes, it can. Uh, try feeding a child and tell me that that five bucks you spent didn't make you happy. If you think money can't buy happiness, you're just shopping in the wrong places. And uh, there's just this raving audience of people that want more. So that's where Thrive came from. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. And, and you know, I've, you know, of course, on the podcast, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we speak to a lot of just, I mean, amazing epic entrepreneurs that have created massive success like you have. And, you know, to, to a lot of people that haven't, that don't have success, that don't have money or financial success, they'll see driven dudes like you and be like, oh, he's greedy. You know, right? but I got to say, man, I mean, the, the most successful people, self-made successful people, at least that I've met, are, always lead from a place of contribution. You know, it's like there's this one huge common denominator and, um, um, man, it's, it's powerful stuff, dude. Yeah, like you said, there, there's a very common theme, you know, and there's, and there's wealthy people that are total douchebags too, right? That happens. Uh, and unfortunately, our media likes to propagate some narrative that rich people are bad and they'll pay taxes and, and when a wealthy person screws up, it's like, ha, 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 you know? Um, and so I would just tell people that money is just, an, it just gives you options. Uh, that's all it does. It's, it doesn't define you. I say this a lot. Your human worth has nothing to do with your net worth. The more money you have does not make you a better person. It does give you more options to be more of who you are. So if you're philanthropic and you help people when you can and you give back in your own way, and you had an extra million dollars of discretionary income, I bet you you'd have more ways of giving back in even greater ways. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I live in my dream home. I'm in my office right now, but this is in my dream home. All, all my dream cars are in the garage or on the driveway. You know, I feel guilt-free about that because I'm also making a difference. I'm, I'm giving back. Yeah. What was it like, man? Just, just out, of, out of curiosity, you know, because I've, I've put on, you know, not, nothing, you know, like, like you do, but I mean, I've, you know, put on a couple speaking events and, and, and things and, Dude, I don't think anybody that hasn't done it, um, even when you're giving away free tickets, man, it can be hard to fill a room, dude, right? And, and you know, what was that learning curve like from, from that first Thrive event to what it's evolved to now? Well, geez, I'm still in that learning curve, so you let me know. But uh, yeah, filling events is hard. It's saturated. Everyone has an event now. I see a new event every single day. Um, and uh, there's a lot of virtual summits and things like that where people can learn without needing to leave their house. So not only do they have to buy a ticket to come to my event, oftentimes it requires an airplane and even a hotel room. So even if you're selling a ticket for a thousand bucks, it could be a three or $4,000 investment for people. And you know, that, that for some deters them, right? Uh, that being said, you know, and, and all, not all our tickets are a thousand bucks, but that's our average. If, if you look at how many people come and what our ticket sales generated, it's about a thousand bucks ahead. And so um, when you look at that, you know, there's, there's no secret that I've found so far other than good old fashioned hard work. I do podcasts like this to talk about my event. Um, it is as far as the mechanics of what I do, there are pixels on all my websites that when people hear a podcast and say, Hey, that sounded interesting. I want to go take a look at his event. I've now pixeled them and they're going to see me in their Facebook. And when they go and read an article on Forbes, I'm going to be in the display ad. And when they're on their Instagram, I'm going to be in their Instagram right now. That's technology. I don't really understand. I pay people for that. That's what my company does. I was talking about the marketing company. 
Um, and so naturally, they, I'm their own client, right? But for those of you that are hearing this for the first time, that's over your head, don't feel bad. It was over my head 18 months ago too, but it's all called retargeting. And so we do a lot on retargeting. And then I do a lot of joint ventures. Um, I go to people who have large lists and Thrive is, you know, I pat myself on the back. It's a fantastic fit. And, you know, the two years that we did it, a lot of the attendees said it was the best event they've ever been to in their entire lives. And a lot of them are self-proclaimed, you know, event junkies. Like I've gone to 60 of these and this was the best of all the big names. So I really appreciate that. I give credit to the speakers and the attendees. But uh, that being said, a lot of people reach out to me now and say, hey, Cole, I have an email list of 50,000. I want to email them out. Can you give me a piece of ticket sales if I do? And those are called affiliates or joint venture partners. And so I say yes to that as well. And that's really it, man, is just getting on as many podcasts and, and talking about Thrive as often as I can to drive as much traffic to the website as I can. Some people will buy a ticket right there on the spot. Others, I'm literally going to stock them anytime they're using a social media uh, like Facebook, Instagram, or whatever, Twitter, or if they're online, I'm going to be freaking everywhere on display ads or Facebook uh, until the event. Um, and then people with large lists emailing. And, and that's really it. And then now in our third year, you know, we've got this loyal uh, group and following that are coming back. So that helps too, right? That we're not starting from scratch. Uh, there are actual people who have gone, had their lives changed forever who are coming back. Um, but it's no easier this year because we keep growing the event. If it was only 200 people, it would already be sold out. We've already sold 200 tickets and we haven't even opened ticket sales yet. We just did that last year at the event. Um, but we want to keep growing our audience. There are actually more tickets to sell every year, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, dude. So when is, um, I mean, our, 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 everybody that's watch and listen to this is, is, is either an entrepreneur or somebody that's um, here because they're striving to be, get the knowledge they need to become an entrepreneur. Um, and I mean, Thrive's definitely an event that, uh, um, you know, they all need to, I'm sure, be at, right? So, right. like, do like, where, where's the best place to um, learn what, when the dates are, when the events are, learn more about Thrive? The date is in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. It is September 29th through October 1st. That is a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, if they want to hear more about it, you can just go to the website, attendthrive.com. That's attend, like I'm going, thrive, like you see on my t-shirt, or thrive, like the word thrive.com. And uh, they can see all the speakers and uh, the dates. And you know we have a really rad discounted room block uh, for the Hard Rock and things like that. Um, awesome. And those of you watching or listening, wherever you're at, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the website, there'll be a link right below where you can check that out and cool. um, uh, definitely do that. So, man, I'm, I'm you know, I, I shouldn't say that. Um, uh, I mean, you've always had, it sounds like you've always had this trait where you're, you're able to go out there and network um, and uh, set up those, those strategic strategic partnerships or, I mean, from the, your, your first investor partner, right? Um, and then, you know, you talked about being a partner with Ty Lopez, which I, again, another guy that I think um, pretty much anybody that's watching or listening to this knows, knows that name. Um, I mean, some, for somebody that's looking to go out there and, and kind of do that, right? They, they want to create some, maybe they've got a great idea, but they're looking for somebody to partner with, like, like a Ty Lopez, or, or for example, like, how, how do you even start? Because a lot of these guys that like, you might want to become a, a, some type of a partner with, or, or even have as a mentor, right? It's not even a, a partner with, man, they're busy. Like Grant Cardone, man, you know, right? I mean, that dude's, you know, worth $100 million. It, 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 you can't just take the guy to a cup of coffee and pick his brain. Right. That's not funny. I was actually on the phone with him yesterday pitching on doing something together. So that's funny that you randomly picked him. Uh, so I would say this is, this is advice that, you know, so I always tell people, I can tell you what you want to hear or what you need to hear. What you need to hear is nobody wants to partner with you until you bring something to the table. And, uh, you know, what I brought to my original lender way back in the beginning of my career was time. He didn't have the time I did. So I did all the work. He brought the money. That's how I got him. I spent the time chasing contractors, going to the job, dealing with the freaking yuck of, of real estate, right? It's not all puppy dogs and lollipops. There's parts that suck too, uh, failing inspections and things like that. I dealt with all that nightmare, dealing with uh, uh, city uh, permitting and all that crap. I did it. He did nothing and made just as much as me. So the value I brought there was time. Uh, with Ty Lopez specifically, he gets people asking him to partner with him every single day. He actually asked me to partner with him last year to teach real estate and to start a real estate education course, which is what we've done together. That's how we partner together. And that's after me being in the trenches for 11 years. 
I have 11 years of real estate investor education or sorry, ed, ed, uh, experience before I started educating people on it. And so I think that a lot of people just want that relationship to have tomorrow to just pick somebody and assume they're going to pick you. But I don't partner with people unless they can bring something I can't do personally or I'm unwilling to do. Right. Uh, so for Ty Lopez specifically, he says this in our program. So this is no knock to him. He doesn't know how to invest in real estate. He has some buying holds, right? He does well financially. And so he owns like a farm and acreage. And, and so he sticks his money in real estate and just leaves alone. But he has no idea how to raise money through private lenders. He's a smart enough guy. He can figure it out, but he doesn't want to. So instead of him spending the next 10 years figuring out how to do real estate, he and I could partner. I bring 100% of the content. He brings his massive following and audience. We put it together and it explodes. So the thing is, before you partner with people, you need to make sure that you're bringing something to the table that your partner doesn't have or doesn't want to do. That's it. And I see a lot of people that want to partner because they know I can make them money. I, get, I can't imagine, Ty, how, how bad it is for him because I get blown up. At my event, Thrive, I'd probably get pitched 800 things by the end of the event because people know it's my event. They know my face. And every single time I'm off stage, I'll be walking to go pee. I'll be peeing and someone's pitching me on doing something with them <laughs> while I'm peeing. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, never mind. But it's like, come on, there's, there's a right time for this and this is not it. Um, and so the bottom line is most people, it's a very one-sided proposition. Hey, cool, let's partner together. Why? Well, because you got this and you got this. You got, okay, but what do you have for me? And so I would say that for anyone out there who wants to partner, go become an expert or go get some credibility or go do something that the other person liked for, for my lender. It was time. Go do something that they don't have or aren't willing to do. He wasn't willing to quit his law firm to go flip real estate and running his law firm. He didn't have time. I did. So that's it, man. That's what makes a good partnership. And I could talk about, you know, complimenting each other's strengths and weaknesses and all of that. That's, that's fine as far as picking a partner. But why anyone would pick you is because you have to be able to do something they cannot do themselves. That's, and that just takes time. You're going to have to go, like I said, become an expert or get credibility or something first. And that's what a lot of people don't want to hear. They're like, oh, so I got to actually go work. Well, then I'm over it. All right, well, then you're over it. But if you're willing to do the work, then people are willing to partner with you. Yeah. Yeah, love it, dude. So, with you being pitched so many, so many things, right? Um, and, and maybe it's not even a, a, a pitch. I mean, it's just an opportunity that that because I'm sure. I mean, the opportunities, especially when you get to the level that you're at, dude. I mean, um, there's a lot of opportunities, and a lot of these opportunities be great opportunities, right? How sure. do you internally gauge what to say yes to and what to say no to? Because you can't say yes to everything. Um, you can't get overextended, right? Like, I mean, do you have an internal process that you follow? Yeah. So uh, let's just talk as an investor where I'm not an actual business partner, but I'm just giving someone money. Um, they have to have proof of concept. It has to be totally ready to go. Uh, and it has to be in an industry that I'm interested in and that I can add value to. I'm not a bank. If you just want money, go to a bank. If I'm going to partner with somebody, it's because I have the strategic relationships or experience they need. So when someone comes to me and says, hey, Cole, I have this new nylon company that doesn't tear. I mean, I've literally been pitched on this. I'm not kidding you. Women who wear nylons, that, uh, what is that tear called? Run or running in your nylon, whatever it is. Um, this guy's like, hey, it's this new thing. It looks the same. It feels the same, but they can rub on walls and it's not going to put a run in their stockings, whatever the heck it's called. Dude, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about the industry. I don't know anything about the poly nylon synthetic, whatever you're talking about. And I don't know anything about distribution of nylons. I don't know how to get you like, you know, so I was like, yeah, man, I'm sure you're going to make millions of dollars. Good luck. I just, there's nothing I can do for you other than write a check. And that's not how I invest versus, uh, what's another one that I invested in? Um, the uh, credit card processing company. It was not mine. I was asked to be part of it. I invested in it. I have partners who run tens of millions of dollars a month of, when I say partners, friends and colleagues, uh, who run tens of millions of dollars a month in credit card processing. So there's the strategic relationships that say, hey, I'm gonna invest in your company and let's just make the numbers simple. You're doing a hundred bucks a month of credit card processing. I'm gonna invest in you now. I'm gonna bring all my friends and make you invest, uh, have a thousand dollars a month. We're talking tens of millions, but to make it simple, I'm buying in at a hundred, I have the friends and family members that I'll bring them over to our new business, do the credit card processing for them, and I'll take the monthly uh, spend from 100 bucks to 1000 bucks and 10x this company in the next 90 days because I have those relationships. So that's exactly what I did. I invested in that company, went out to these different friends and family members of mine that are running huge organizations that literally do tens of millions a month of credit card processing, 
and the value of that company went through the roof. I don't know anything about terminals and freaking all this MasterCard crap. I don't want to know anything about the nuts and bolts. I just knew people and said, hey, I own this company now. Let's, let's, why don't you quit with whoever you're using and come over here and let us service your credit card processing for you? And the company blew up. So that's what I'm interested in. I know the people or I have the industry knowledge to instantly make the company more valuable. I don't want to pay for stockings that don't get holes in them. Uh, so that's what I look for. I, I need to be interested in it. It's got to be something I believe in. It's got to be something that if I pay for it, my daughters and wife will be proud of me. It's not something that's hurting people or relationships, right? Um, and then it's got to be something that I have the relationships or the values, or that, that's sorry, the relationships or the understanding to add value. Yeah, yep. awesome, man. So, you know, you, you've, you're married, you've got, uh, you know, your, your, your young kids. Um, and this is something a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. I mean, and we see it all the time. We see these entrepreneurs that go out there and create these successful, epic, amazing companies. Um, but then they neglect their family. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm a fan of the word balance entrepreneurship, but I, cause I don't know if it, there is such a thing as balance. Um, but you can also, be very intentional and, and make right. sure that those relationships um, get the attention that they need. Like, how do you, man? I mean, if we're going to throw out the word balance, like how do you balance it all? So a um, couple of ways. I have an office that has employees in it right now. Uh, I'm at home. Both my little girls are asleep, one on the other side of this wall and one on the other side of the house. Uh, so I come home and do everything I can from home from home. I have a full blown studio at my office. And when I realized this was a video podcast, I was like, Oh, sick. I'll set up the cameras. I'll be standing the whole time. Cause I talk better standing than sitting. And I'm going to live stream this from my studio. So behind me, you're going to see on the wood walls. It's going to be sick. And I was like, crap. But then that means I won't be able to get home in time to have lunch with my daughters or put them down for nap. I'm going to do it from home instead in my freaking cluttered home office. Um, and so I set, uh, times, I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with my family every day, unless I'm traveling. I just got back. I was on a business trip. Um, but when I'm home, I eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day with my family. I took my four-year-old to school at 845. So watch this. I'll just tell you the day, right? Let's watch this. I don't know if this is what you wanted as an answer. You can edit this out if you don't like it. But um, ate breakfast with the family, answered some emails, did some stuff. I have a personal trainer right now at the gym because I'm trying to get in the best shape of my life. I scheduled it with him from 9 to 1030. We do 90 minutes because I know I have to drop my daughter off at preschool at 845. So I took her to preschool, dropped her off at 845, worked out from 9 to 1030, rushed over to my office, and I had to create content for my podcast and a couple of videos for Thrive that's launching. I recorded in my studio from like 1045 to about 1245, raced home, ate lunch with my girls from 1245 to 130, put them down for nap, and I'm on this podcast at 230, right? So I strategically schedule my days that I'm home for lunches, breakfast, and dinner, and then I take my daughter to and from school. Oh, by the way, I picked my daughter up, sorry, uh, from preschool on the way home from recording the office on the way to lunch. So that's just today and every day looks like that. My wife is my business partner in Thrive. So she and I now spend more time together than we ever have uh, because literally hours a day, not quality time, it's because it's about Thrive. So that's important too. Um, but next to proximity time, hours a day, we've gotten really bad at and now we're getting better at remembering, wait, 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 wait. We got to stop doing business and just be us again. And that's something I struggled with uh, that I'm now getting better at and I'm working at is that I'm with my wife all day long, but it's never us time. It's business. And we've got to remember we're husband and wife too. So uh, we specifically schedule dates. I'm taking her out tonight to our country club. Um, and it, we, are, we have a rule, no thrive, because that's all we talk about because that's the business she helps in. I never talked about real estate. That's me and my dad. So no thrive, no nothing. I'm just going to ask her how she's doing. She's doing a bikini contest. So, you know, how are your workouts going? How do you like your trainer? How was your day to day at the gym? She'll ask me about this podcast. How was the podcast? And that's it, man. So, so that there's not a clear answer there. I guess the takeaway is you have to specifically schedule it. I, you, you cannot get my time breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't care if Obama or I guess Trump now or whoever, if they want to talk to me, not during family time. Like it's just, it's my top priority. Um, and I literally schedule it in and block my calendar so no one can have that time. Um, and I work from home, even though I have an office. That's I meant to come back to that. Even though I have an office, I have a desk, I have computer monitors, and I have a whole team there working. I work from home 95% of the time. And if I need to work with my team, a lot of times I make them come here. If I have to, I go there. That's it. Yeah. Now, do you, do you have... Um like a, a, I don't know, an intentional part of your day where, where you take that time to 
reflect and then replan that day? Because I mean, it just again with this intense planning that you do. I mean, is it, is this a hardcore daily practice that you're doing? Uh, sort of. So for family, yes. For business, I need to get better at that. Um, I actually was just having that conversation with my wife. I feel like I'm kind of like a puppet and too many people have my strings. Um, and you know, I have my videographer saying, you need to be here at 1045 because this is what happened today because we have to record a podcast because it goes live tomorrow and you don't have one in the can. Right. Um, and so like, so, okay, I've got to go there. But then I have my other guy, my marketer saying, you have to give me the high res photos and bios for all the speakers because the website goes live tomorrow and I only have half of them. It's like, okay. I have so I, un I need to get better at that of, of as far as planning out the day, uh, and not just being reactive. I'm kind of reactive right now in the sense that what I react, Oh, you need video. Okay. I'll go. I'll be at the office in 20 minutes. Oh, you need this. Okay. I'll get my assistant on that. Cause I don't have time. I'll have Chris, my assistant do it instead. And that's an area that I personally want to grow. None of us are perfect. Uh, and I feel like I need to get better at being more strategic with my day. Much of my day is planned out anyway, but in those free moments, it's kind of like I come up for oxygen and someone grabs me real quick. Um, and so that's an area I, I do want to grow in and not be so reactive, but be more intentional in my days. Uh, that's, that's something I'm bad at. So maybe you can give me some advice. You know, I know people will like do it the night before. I've heard that was a good piece of advice. Many people in the beginning of the day plan it. You should actually do it the night before. So when you start your day, it's already done. That's important. Tim Ferriss says to try to only do three things in a day, the three most important things. Cause if you try to do 12 things, you'll do none of them. So pick three. So I know that there are strategies around this and I would highly recommend people do that. Um, and that's an area I need to grow. It's like, I got my family time booked out. Whatever's not booked out, people just take it from me and then the day is over. Yeah. Love it, dude. So, you know, I, I know with Thrive, I mean, you, you, you've developed a, um, you've got, you, you got your, your, your purpose behind what you're doing, why you're doing. Right. And then that came from that, that Mexico trip, um, you know, with that, you know, but, but even when, a lot of people find their purpose or their why. Um, so often we see a lot of people get to the point where they settle for good enough, you know, right? Instead, they're originally they're, they're just on fire going for greatness. And then it's like, man, life's getting us pretty good. We're giving back good. Like, let's take our foot off the accelerator. Um, what keeps you striving for greatness and not selling for good enough? Um, I'm trying to think of the easiest answer. So I, I said big lofty goals that I'll never get to at good enough. Uh, my goal for thrive is to have it be a 5,000 person event, like the biggest in the industry. There, uh, we're going for a thousand this year. This is only the third year. So we had 400 year one, 600 year two. We're trying to get to a thousand this year, but my goal is 5,000. There's no way it's going to get to 5,000 people. If I'm just good enough, you know, uh, my real, my goal with real estate is to make seven figures this year, only doing 10 deals. That'll never happen if it's just good enough. So I think I set goals that are high, but doable. Like, I'm not going to try to set a goal of selling out. I went to Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within in San Jose last fall. There were 15,000 attendees. They completely sold out the, the, I forget what the name of it is. It's where the San Jose Sharks play. But they completely sold out that whole arena. Like it was full. Uh, I'm not trying to say that that's what Thrive is going to be. Not yet anyway. My goal now is to get to 5,000. If we do that, then I'll look at 15,000. So I'm not setting pie in the sky, unrealistic, hey, shoot for a star, land on the moon type of stuff. I'm planning stuff that actually has a possibility of happening, but there's a clear working backwards way of making it reality that requires me to perform at my highest level. I think that's it. I, these aren't goals. These are business plans. And my business plans, I'll never hit if I'm just getting by. Um, and I think the people that settle for just good enough, that's the saddest. Uh, that's, that's complacency. And that's, that's just kind of sad. You know, I don't, I don't want, um, if I had closing words, like let's just say I knew I was about to die and they're like, cool, what are your final words? I would never want them to be like, I did everything just good enough. I was a just good enough dad. I was a just good enough husband. I was a just good enough father. Like if for some reason they were like, Cole, you've got 10 minutes to live. What, you know, what, what, what do you have to say to the world? The last thing coming out of my mouth is everything was just good enough. Uh, it's going to be, I did everything. There are people way better than me, make more money than me, better fathers. Like, they, but I did my best and I laid it all on the field. That's it. Yeah. Love it, man. Um, dude, knowing everything that you, you know now today, um, if you could go back to, to, you know, your, um, what was it to your 21 year old self when, when you were, when you were starting your entrepreneurship journey, um, knowing everything, you know, now, if you could go back and just give yourself two pieces of advice that you feel would just have helped you catapult, uh, uh your career that much quicker and, and, you know, that much further ahead, 
what would that look like? Two pieces of advice. Okay. Um, I started at 21. So my first piece of advice would, well, for me personally would have been, you're not too young. I had this, I really stifled my growth as an entrepreneur because everyone was two or three times my age, especially in real estate, right? Everyone's a 50, 60 year old and I'm 21. Uh, so I would, I would really emphasize that, um, it doesn't matter how old you are. And that's the opposite. If one of your listeners right now is 75 years old, there are all these stories of Colonel Sanders who sold his recipe like at 72 and stuff. It's never too late. So number one would be to have age be no, no def definition or no barrier in what I'm capable of, young or old at all, ever. Number one, age does not matter. Number two, I would have started investing myself a lot sooner. I'm ambitious naturally um, and uh, I work hard naturally. So I had some good results just off of sheer hard work and dedication, but I could have had astronomical results if I would have invested myself sooner and not just relied on my work ethic. Work ethic work, don't ever not work hard. I'm not giving you an excuse not to work hard, but I relied on hard work alone where I could have been working smarter. I could have been working more strategic. And so I would have invested myself a lot sooner than I did. For the first several years of being an entrepreneur, I wasn't even reading books. Like I was just doing what I had to do. I wasn't reading. I have a whole, if I could turn the monitor around, I have a whole library right here of books and I've read most of them. Uh, that was years into my business before I even started buying them. I didn't go to live events. Now I own a live event, right? I, I didn't have any coaches. That took till five years into my career before I hired a coach. So I would invest in personal development way sooner. Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. So I know um, we talked about Thrive and, and, and we gave the listeners the, the link um, to go learn more about Thrive and go check that out and, and hopefully go book those tickets right away, um, which again, everybody, that'll be right below um, wherever you're at, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, website, wherever you're at, um, that link's right below. So make sure to check that out. Um, if, if people want to, you know, I mean, just is there, if you want to follow you, right, follow your content. I mean, is is the Thrive website um, the best place to go? Are there other places people that can learn more about you and follow you? Uh, yeah, social media. We're as of literally now getting real big on putting my videos out on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. So everything is just my, my name, Cole Hatter. That's Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, at Cole Hatter, uh, Twitter. So attendthrive.com is the best website. As far as social media, you pick it. I'm on it, at Cole Hatter, one word. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it, dude. So, um, I know we're getting long on time, man. You're, you're a busy, busy man. So I'm respect your time. So, um, you know, our listeners are here right now cause they want to go out there and create an amazing epic life for themselves and their family, just like you've been able to do. Do you have any last words of advice that you'd like to leave them with so they can go out there and do exactly that? Uh, yeah, I would go back to some of the advice that we've already touched on, um, earlier in this thing. I would start by having a bigger reason, right? Uh, and listen, I have a beautiful wife and little girls, but that's always the cliche answer. I'm doing it for my family. I can I get it. Um, that's great. You know, me getting engaged was part of my help too, but uh, I would, I would argue that you are put on earth for more than just having a family. Uh, that, now I don't want to diminish that. That should be your number one priority. We already talked about that. So I'm not taking away from that, but a lot of people that's as far as they take it. You are here to be an amazing parent. If you are an amazing spouse, if you are, I get it. But what else? Find that thing and make that a part of why you do what you do. I think that's really important. Call it purpose. Call it why, as Simon Sinek does. Anything you want that's a word that you like, put it in there. Uh, so I'd say that's you know, a, a piece of advice that I would recommend for people. I'd also recommend considering having a for-purpose business model so that the more money you make, the bigger difference you're making in the world. There's a lot of stuff. If you want to learn more about that, come to Thrive or start following the videos I'm going to put out there. Um, and another piece of advice is back to what I said earlier. Don't be emotionally attached to the outcome. As soon as you can release that, you're really capable of doing more because you're not afraid of the result. Um, and the last thing I would say, I mean, I could give advice all day long. Maybe I'm giving too much. But the last thing I would say is um, Gary calls it self-awareness. Everybody out there is going to tell you who you need to be and what you need to do. Figure out who you want to be and what works for you. For me, working from home works for me, even though I have an office with a desk. I don't go to it as rarely as I can. Uh, where uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, if you watch his social media, doesn't look like he's ever home, right? So who's right? Well, that's right for him. And for me, working from home is right for me. Uh, so a lot of people are going to tell you what you need to do. If you want to be successful, do this. What I'm going to say, back to that inner reflection, figure out who you are and what you want to be, and then figure out what you need to do to be that person period. Don't, 
don't try to be what someone else says success looks like. Do it, you know, create your dream life and build a business around it, period. Yeah, awesome, man. Powerful words, dude. I, I, I know, and I just want to get this out there real quick. Uh, um, uh, cause I know you talked about your podcast is, is your podcast. I know you talked about putting the videos on social media, but is your podcast available on, on iTunes? Yeah. Um, so places? It's, it's called thrive, make money matter. And basically what it is, is I take a one to four minute clip from the different speakers who have been at thrive, like Grant Cardone, you know, the people that have come up, Gary Vaynerchuk, Robert Hershevec, just an awesome two minute piece of advice. Uh, and I just play it on my podcast. I introduce it, then they talk and then I speak maybe three or four minutes about what it means. So the whole episode is only about 10 minutes long. Uh, it's video as well. So it's on YouTube, the videos or the audio is on iTunes um, and uh, Lipson. I don't know where it all actually goes, to be honest. They all, they all do that for me. Um, and so I get on camera like this. I introduce the video. Then they see the speaker and hear the speaker. And then they see and hear me afterwards. If you're listening on iTunes, you'll just hear the audio for it. And that's it, man. It's just 10 minute episodes twice a week, Monday and Friday of some of the best content that's ever come from five and me just unpacking it. Yep. And uh, you can find it. It's just called the Thrive Make Money Matter podcast. Yep. Badass, badass. Love it. And, and you guys, again, that are, that are, you guys that are watching or listening to this, um, we'll have all um, Oracle's uh, websites below here. Um, so you'll be able to connect with them and make sure that you do that right away. Um, every single podcast, you guys, I know I ended the podcast with this, but information without implementation today is really just the start of delusion. Information is not power. It's taking action on that information that creates power in your world. I mean, Cole talks about so many amazing things um, that can help you go out there and improve in every aspect of your life and really create that life that you know you want. So take action on something that you learned today and go out there and create that life you know you want and deserve. And Cole, man, dude, I know how busy you are, man. And, and this has been a huge honor, my friend. Likewise, man. Thanks for having the show. I really, I really enjoyed myself. It was cool. Yeah, it was awesome. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Peace.